Welcome. My name is Jerry Dotrieve. I have the honor of being the Dean of the Gabilis School of Business here at Roger Williams, and I'd like to, to welcome you to the presentation of our Center for Advanced Financial Education program. Uh, I think you'd be very impressed with what you see today. We're very pleased uh, to have uh, our president here to see this for the first time, as well as board members. My advisory board members are here as well. And the purpose, I, mean, I know most of you know something about this program, but uh, if you're here thinking, okay, they, they, yeah, something about managing real money, dollar, you know, real dollar portfolio, and they're going to tell us how they did, and that's it. But what, uh, what the students are going to explain today is the process they go through, the learning process. And this is really, really exciting because I just, um, I just finished a few minutes ago a meeting with my advisory board, and we had a very good meeting with the Gabelli School Advisory Board, and the theme of the meeting was really experiential learning. And uh, one of the comments made by uh, one of the members, uh, just this is about, is the key is to keep it real. And that's what it's all about. I mean, we do a wonderful job here at Roger Williams in education, in the classroom with faculty who are great teachers. But, you know, beyond that, what's so critical is the experiential opportunities that our students have. And so when, when uh, one of the uh, faculty members that was presenting this morning said, you know, so my job is to keep it real, you know, that just said it all about, about programs like this. And so I come back to this program, because this really is, I won't say the first program we did here at Roger Williams that, that, that kept it real, but, but it is an example of experiential learning at its best, because obviously real dollars, you know, is, uh, is involved here. But it is a real world experience. So, so we're very pleased that, uh, that you're here to have the students explain what they've been doing for the uh, past semester and look ahead to their futures. And uh, having said that, I'd like to uh, have the honor of introducing our, our relatively new president uh, who's joined us today to give you his welcome. And then we'll turn it over to the students. So I'm happy to welcome uh, Ian. He's a busy guy. He's got a board meeting this afternoon. He's been in meetings all day. But I'm very pleased to introduce our new president, Dr. Donald Parrish. Well, thanks very much, Jerry. I didn't know I was going to be asked to do anything today. I was already sleeping down here. But uh, this is this is uh, this is good stuff. I, I I know when I was at my last university, they were the students in the business school were pushing, and the dean was pushing, to be able to do something a little bit like this to actually not use monopoly money anymore but actually use real money. And I said, wait a minute, real money? Are you kidding me? And he said, no, no, this is this is the, the way to go. And I said, are, are you sure you're about this? Because, I mean, this is real money. No, 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 this is the way to go. So they may have done that, but um, it's already here. It's already happening. And, uh, you know, my plan is, if they do an impressive presentation, I'm sure they will, to take all the money in our endowment and give it to me. <laughs> Good stuff. I say, if you do well enough, you get a scholarship. <laughs> I, I think we can have something going here. Uh, and it, it beats our current philosophy, which is to go down and buy a lot of lottery tickets. <laughs> <laughs> it's worked out so so. But, uh, bad weeks. Anyway, you're not here for me. You're here to hear what these students have to say. So, Jerry, I'm going to turn it back to you. I guess you're going to I'm going to turn it over to Leland. So, okay. Ben Jeffers. Thank you. Dean Dotry, President Barris. First, I'd like to introduce to you the fall 2011 student fund managers. To my left, Alex Palios, Ryan Taylor, Danny Shearholt, Suzanne Steele, and I'm Leland Jeffers. And to my right, we have Abdulmo San Altuajri, Anthony Di Bartolomeo, Ashley Joseph, Darren Hamill, and I'm Adam Bettencourt. To begin, the Student Investment Management Fund, housed in the Center for Advanced Financial Education, is a real dollar portfolio managed by a select group of students under the supervision of Dr. Michael Melton known to those in the business school as DOC. This financial capstone course, Finance 450 Portfolio Analysis, is a very unique and valuable experience that provides each student fund manager with the opportunity to take what they've learned throughout their education and apply it to the real world of portfolio management. The Center for Advanced Financial <coughs> Education is not the only program of its type across the nation. However, there are several defining characteristics that set us aside from our competition. First, the student fund managers do not inherit a previously constructed portfolio. 
In order to take on the role of student fund manager from day one, we inherit only cash and create an entire portfolio from scratch. This is essential because each student fund manager must understand every single aspect of portfolio management, from initial economic assessment to portfolio evaluation and reallocation. Additionally, student fund managers in this program experience a level of autonomy not found in other programs across the nation. We have the freedom to make trades needing only the approval of DOC. Imagine where other schools have to take their decisions to a board of advisors for approval, possibly waiting weeks for a buy or sell decision. Here at RWU, student fund managers benefit from the ability to trade in real time. This entire process is conducted in an industry-like atmosphere. The Center for Advanced Financial Education is designed to replicate a private wealth management firm and incorporates technology that allows us to use real-time market data so as to remain as up-to-date and current as industry professionals. As you will learn, working, throughout, working in the cafe and managing a real dollar portfolio is truly a full-time job, requiring long hours, often overnight. All the student fund managers would agree that no other experience could better prepare you for life in industry today. Throughout this presentation, you will learn about the extreme market conditions that we had to endure throughout the semester. Behavioral news changed market perceptions on an hourly basis, and even companies with strong fundamentals su suffered from severe downswings due to global economic bias. As we have mentioned, students took on the role of fund managers from day one. In order to do so, we as a group had a specific mission to follow. First, we followed guidelines set forth in the Markowitz portfolio theory. Secondly, the top-down approach would be used to provide the most in-depth analysis incorporating all that we have learned throughout our academic career. And finally, managing a real dollar portfolio meant that each student fund manager must represent the CAFE in the most professional manner while understanding the fiduciary responsibility that we have to our university. We concluded that our objective would be domestic large cap blend, based on the global uncertainty that exists in the marketplace as of late. To carry out this objective, we followed the time-tested yet old-school approach of top-down analysis. In order to create a well-diversified portfolio, Dr. Melton has taught us that it is first important to understand global economic conditions so as to target successful sectors, industries, and finally companies. This entire process is done in hopes of creating a portfolio yielding the highest possible amount of return for the lowest possible amount of risk. Tony and Al will now come up to take you through the initial stages of our top-down approach. Thank you, Leland. The first step in our top-down approach is economic analysis. We separate our analysis into both international and domestic analysis. Each SIMP manager was allocated specific regions across the globe to research and gauge performance. Through international economic analysis, we focused heavily on GDP, unemployment, inflation, as well as past performances. As you can see from the chart behind me, we were bullish on only 10 of these countries. However, each of these countries had strong ties to the European debt crisis. This led us to our domestic large cap blend. During our holding period, uh, the European debt crisis was the center of market volatility. You can see here that this has been characterized by high debt levels unsustainable bond yields, and most importantly, lack of cooperation among EU government leaders. This led the SIP managers to reevaluate our international outlook to bearish. We continued with our top-down approach moving to domestic analysis. Initial economic analysis was performed prior to our portfolio construction. On a weekly basis, student fund managers would update these economic indicators to get a strong grasp on the markets moving forward. In comparison to countries around the globe, corporate America looks extremely strong, as companies are hoarding cash, raising dividends, and showing strong signs of future growth. This led us to our moderately bullish outlook on the U.S. markets. You can see here the 13 economic indicators that were updated weekly. We only felt a small section of these economic indicators heavily influenced market movement. The first one is weighted GDP, which grew at an annual rate of 2% moving into the third quarter. This was coupled with consumer confidence, which rose to a rate of 56, showing renewed optimism among consumers moving into the new year. Furthermore, unemployment fell to its lowest level in two and a half years, falling from 9% to 8.6%. Following. Industrial production rose 0.7% due to an increase in factory outputs and mining production. And lastly, retail sales, coming in at a record pace during Black Friday and Cyber Monday. This led us to our bullish outlook on the retail industry. All the SIP managers were moderately bullish on the domestic markets. We understood that the EU debt crisis extended from international markets to domestic markets, meaning that we needed to do an in-depth sector analysis to diversify this risk. Sec um, snowball sector rotation was used to depict the typical um, economic cycle. You can see here specific ETF funds used during portfolio construction to accurately weight each sector within our portfolio. Anticipating our economy was coming out of a contractionary period into an expansionary period, we heavily weighted technology, services, and consumer goods based on the cyclicality of the sector. However, we did underweight financials, industrials, and basic materials due to the strong ties to the European debt crisis. After we had accurate sector weightings, the next step in the top-down approach was industry analysis. We understood within every sector, of course, there are numerous industries meaning that we needed to narrow down the best performing industries within each sector. Behind me is an example of the services sector, which is made up of 57 industries. Each SIP manager evaluated industries moving to the fourth quarter. 
If you look closely into this chart, you can see that we were bearish on airlines as recently supported by American Airlines filing for bankruptcy. However, we were bullish on air freight and transportation as UPS is the leading distributor throughout the holiday seasons. Resorts and casinos was another industry in which we looked at which we were extremely bearish on due to the high market volatility and the high beta attached to these stocks. And lastly, specialty eateries. Starbucks has an extremely effective management and is going to show strong growth in the near future. Once the SIP vendors had accurate target sector and industry weightings, the last step of the top-down approach was company analysis. We learned in Ashley now take you through our first and most relevant company analysis technique in Corporate Living Cafe today. Thank you, Tony. While carrying out the company selection process, we used fundamental analysis first and foremost, followed by technical and behavioral analysis. The goal of fundamental analysis is to find financially sound companies in comparison to their industry and direct competitor to determine how this fiscal strength will equate to the company's future growth. Incorporated in this method, we considered a combination of key fundamentals, financial statements, ratios, and earnings per share. Beginning our fundamental analysis, we focused on key statistics like beta, PE, PEG, and financial ratios like return on assets and return on equity. In each instance, it is necessary to compare these fundamentals against their direct competitor and their industry. As a group, we target our holdings on betas that were comparable with that of the industry. It is important to understand that the beta for basic material will be much higher than that of utility. One of the differentiating factors of this program is that we calculated our own betas for each company using regression analysis. Behind me, you'll see an example of the final outcome of this calculation. In order for this number to hold relevance, it must fall within two constraints. The R squared must be greater than 0.25, and the absolute value of the T statistic must be greater than 2. If these numbers do not comply, then we know that our data is not strong enough to provide us with an accurate depiction of beta. Just as important, the price to earnings ratio played a significant role in determining the fiscal strength of a firm. We targeted our holdings to have a lower forward than trailing PE, as this indicates stronger earnings relative to price. This concept can be seen here on the company's summary sheet for Tiva Pharmaceuticals, showing strong fiscal strength and growth for the company. We targeted companies with a price to earnings growth ratio less than one and are lower than the industry <coughs> average. A peg lower than one shows that a company has great potential growth. Furthermore, financial ratios like return on assets and return on equity were considered when evaluating management effectiveness and efficiency of the firm. As you can see, our holding Tiva Pharmaceuticals was much more efficient in regards to return on assets assets and return on equity in comparison to its direct competitor. The company met these initial requirements, we then continued the fundamental analysis on a deeper level. We performed an analysis of the company's financial statements for further insight into the firm. In this stage, we common sized the balance sheet and the income statement of the company and its direct competitor. Common sizing is done in order to standardize all elements of the statements as percentages of a common base figure. In the balance sheet, the base figure is total assets, while in the income statement, the, balance, the common base figure is sales. Looking at net income and SHG expenses, you can see how this process allowed for an easy analysis of trends using our stoplight technique, and is essential in comparing companies of differing size. We also looked at the statement of cash flows, which shows how changes in the balance sheet and income statement affect cash and cash equivalents, breaking down the analysis to operational, investing, and financing activities. As fund managers, we like to follow the model of cash is king while analyzing the fiscal strength of the company. Continuing with our fundamental analysis, each student fund manager performed a complete analysis of the company's ratios and statistics. Behind me is, is an example of how we can compare a potential holding against its competitor. The focus on ratios was to determine if a company was properly valued. Our next step was to examine the company's earnings per share. Here, students looked at second, third, and forecasted fourth quarter earnings to ensure these numbers had not been negatively trending. These findings were then compared to those of their direct competitor. Next, we looked at historical EPS surprises. If a company historically missed earnings, then they would clearly be a risky buy. However, if a company historically met or beat earnings, then they would be a safer buy with potential benefit from earnings releases. In this final stage of EPS analysis, we calculated projected earnings growth using forecasted and current earnings estimates from Zach. This gives us a good picture at the rate at which a company will grow earnings over the course of the year. Brian and Adam will now continue explaining the company selection process by taking you through the steps involved in performing a complete technical analysis. Thank you, Ashley. After carefully examining each company from a fundamental standpoint, we then follow up by performing technical analysis. It's important to note that we are one of the only schools in the nation that focuses on technical analysis at the undergraduate level. Technical analysis is a method of evaluating securities by analyzing statistics generated from historical market activity. With a shorter holding period, we understand the importance of buying and selling opportunities. Therefore, technical analysis plays a key role when determining the proper time to purchase one of our selected holdings. We also use technical analysis to determine the directional momentum of a stock, 
identify cyclical patterns based on past performance data, and to determine whether there are any bullish or bearish trends that we might see in the near future. Some of the relevant indicators that we use in the cafe are Bollinger Bands, Relative Strength Index, MACD Oscillator, Stochastic Oscillator, and Support and Resistance Levels. Bollinger Bands are informative indicators that we use to determine the volatility in the stock's price. They consist of a 20-day moving average and upper and lower resistance levels. These resistance levels, levels represent two standard deviations away from the moving average. When the price of a stock touches the lower bound three times in a row, it sends a bullish signal to the analyst. Inversely, the opposite is also true for three touches of the upper bound. As you can see from this chart of one of our selected holdings, Bed Bath & Beyond, the price of a share touches the lower constraint three consecutive times, the first of which occurs on November 21st, the second on November 23rd, and finally on November 25th. Immediately following the third touch of the lower bound, we see the price begin to appreciate. As analysts, we understand that looking at one technical indicator alone does not provide a clear picture of a stock's future trend. Having said that, we also observe the readings of the relative strength index. The RSI is, is a uh, technical indicator that determines the uh, an overbought or, over or oversold condition based on the directional momentum of the stock and um, uh, recent gains compared to recent losses. The graph of the RSI ranges from 0 to 100. A company is considered to be overbought when the RSI reaches a level of 70 or greater. Inversely, a company is considered to be oversold as the RSI drops to a level of 30 or less. This is an extremely useful indicator when determining the proper time to buy or sell one of our selected holdings or make a momentum play within the market. Looking back to this chart of Bed Bath & Beyond, we see the RSI drops to a level of 30, indicating an oversold condition. Immediately after, we see the price show immense gains. Another indicator that we use in the cafe is the MACD oscillator, and we generally use it to determine the directional momentum of a stock based on 12 and 26 day moving averages. The MACD oscillator stands for the Moving Average Convergence and Divergence Oscillator which measures the difference between a 12-day moving average of the price and a 26-day moving average. An analyst can assume a bullish trend when the 12-day average crosses the 26-day average from below, and the opposite is also true for assuming bearish trends. The gap, or divergence between the two averages, sends a signal to the analyst of how significant and persistent the growth or decline in the price will be. Looking back to this chart of Bed Bath & Beyond, we can observe a bullish trend from the MACD oscillator as we actually see the 12-day moving average cross the 26-day moving average from below. As Ryan just discussed, this large divergence between the two moving averages shows that the persistence for growth is very strong. An informative indicator we use to help improve market timing is the stochastic oscillator. This specific indicator gives an analyst a feel for the short-term momentum direction of the stock price. This is an extremely helpful indicator when determining short-term trends due to the fact that the momentum of the price will always change direction before the actual price does. These trends can be observed by following the movements of the short-term and long-term lines. The short-term line, depicted as the blue line on the, on the chart behind me, represents the closing price in relation to a price range over a specified period of time, while the long-term line, depicted as the red line, is the three-period moving average of the short-term line. Similar to the MACD oscillator, we can assume a bullish trend when we see the short-term line cross the long-term line from below. As you can see from the stochastic chart of Bed Bath & Beyond, the short-term line has crossed the long-term line from below, and consequently, the price shows substantial growth. We also use other more advanced technical indicators in the Center for Advanced Financial Education. However, in the interest of time, I'm just going to touch on them rather than explain them. As you can see from a chart of a different one of our holdings, U uh, UPS, there is an initial strong decline in the value of a share. Within this downtrend, we can identify two bear flags, which signal that the price will continue to fall. However, as the price turns around, we can identify a bull flag showing that the price will, be, will begin to appreciate. There is also another very strong bullish indicator that we can observe from this chart called an inverse head and shoulders pattern. And as you can see, immediately following this second shoulder, the price begins to rise. Observe this positive indicator and then followed by a long period of consistent price growth. These two parallel lines you see demonstrate a channel in which the price generally follows and ultimately shows an upper and lower bound in which the price will remain. As analysts, we understand that using one of these technical indicators standalone does not actually paint an accurate picture of what is to come in the future. Said that, having said that, we use these indicators in conjunction with each other to tell a very specific story. However, it is necessary for everyone to keep in mind that no decision will be made from a technical standpoint before we first confirm the company's strong fundamentals. 
We now invite Danny Nashley to discuss our final stage in the company selection process. Thank you, Ryan. The third and final stage in company selection process is behavioral analysis. Behavioral analysis involves influential news <coughs> driving specific companies, industries, sectors, and the overall market. Some of these news drivers come from economic indicators, comments from the Fed, presidential speeches, mergers, upgrades, downgrades, and more recently, news from Euro leaders. In the cafe, we use news sources such as SDS Market Watch, Zach's Investments, Bloomberg Online, and CNBC, all of which provide us with real-time market data. We use all of these news sources when evaluating new stock picks to determine if there's any news that could behaviorally drive the stock price. Behavioral news was extremely important considering the market we faced during our holding period. I'm sure you've all heard of the Lehman Brothers collapse in 2008, which represents the largest bankruptcy in U.S. history and a massive failure in the U.S. financial sector. On September 15, 2008, the day the news of the bankruptcy was released, the market was driven down 4.7 percent. More recently, on July 8, 2011, Standard & Poor's downgraded United States creditworthiness one notch from its AAA rating. And as, as news, the market fell 6.7 percent in one day. This example demonstrates how the intangible news of the downgrade negatively affected the market 2 percent more than the tangible collapse of the Lehman Brothers. This shows just how much more of an impact behavioral news has on the volatility of our markets today. Comments from the Fed also play a huge role in driving our markets. On September 21st of this year, the Chairman of the Fed, Ben Bernanke, announced a plan to lower interest rates, known as Operation Twist. This aims to encourage people and businesses to borrow more, allowing them to spend more. Over a period of time, the Fed intends to purchase $400 billion in long-term Treasury securities, while simultaneously selling an equal amount of short-term securities. The initial response was negative. Investors feared the economic recovery would take longer than first expected, and the market declined 3.2% in a single day. Not only does the news affect the markets, it also plays a significant role driving the stock price of specific companies. We research behavioral news during the construction of our portfolio, as well as throughout our holding period, so we can get a better idea of the stock's direction. So we could either purchase more shares or sell out of our holdings if necessary. McDonald's, for example, raised its quarterly dividend 15%, marking the 35th consecutive year that McDonald's has given its shareholders a raise. As you can see on the chart behind me, over the next three days, their stock price appreciated 6.5%. Although we are a domestic portfolio, globalization is growing, which is why it's extremely important for us to stay up to date with the market at all times. We do this by reporting on the market throughout the U.S. trading day, as well as 11 p.m. and 4 a.m. in the morning. A major focus throughout this presentation has been on the European debt crisis. News regarding Europe has been one of the most influential drivers of global markets during our holding period, considering there have been a number of days where the market has seen drastic swings. November 9th demonstrates a day when investors became more worried about Italy's default risk as their 10-year bond yield spiked above 7%. In addition to this high yield, European Union officials said they had no plans in rescuing Italy. As you can see, the market declined 3.7%. A major focus point. Throughout the semester, we made several momentum trades based off of news coming out of Europe. One example was on October 26th, a day where European Union leaders reportedly reached a major agreement. The new plan was aimed to resolve the debt crisis in Greece, instability in the banking industry, and an unobtainable bailout fund. This news was released around 3.15 p.m. on Wednesday. We expected investors to react positively to this news, so we immediately purchased a European financial ETF, EUFN. The next day, the market spiked 3.4%, and we sold our position later in the day for a gain of over 11%. As you can see from our examples, behavioral news plays a huge role in driving specific companies as well as the overall market. It's extremely important to take into consideration behavioral risks in the market today before investing. Behavioral analysis is the last step in the company selection process. <coughs> now that we've selected our companies, Suzanne and Garen will discuss the construction of our portfolio. Thank you, Ryan. Markowitz portfolio theory states that a portfolio consisting of 20 to 25 assets should be diversified across at least eight sectors and 17 industries. Our portfolio covers all sectors besides the long range and 25 different industries. The ultimate goal of the student fund managers is to create a sense that yields a maximum return while minimizing risk. For the first stage of the portfolio process, the construction process, we brought 250 plus companies to the table and narrowed it down to the best 50. From there, we examined each company more thoroughly and slimmed our selection to the ideal portfolio size of 25 holdings. The best way to narrow down some of those 50 stocks is to put them into a correlation matrix, which gives the correlation coefficients of each stock compared to all the others. A correlation coefficient measures the relative strength of movements of two assets in relation to one another. It ranges between negative one and positive one, where negative one represents a perfect negative correlation or movements in opposite direction, which we want to diversify away unique risk, and positive one, which represents a perfect positive correlation or movements in the same direction, which we don't want. We color coded our matrix using a stoplight approach, making values greater than 0.75 red, values less than zero green, and values in between yellow. We 
then made our final matrix, which we're holding using 220 day daily data. The limited red indicates that all our stocks fit well together and overall uncorrelated. It also shows that many of our stocks move inversely with the market, limiting our unique risk. If you take a look at the relationship between McDonald's and the S&P 500, you'll see a great example of an inverse correlation, having a coefficient of negative 0.55. So, if the market were to go up one day, McDonald's should go down. But, if the market were to go down, in theory, McDonald's would go up. Once established that we had a diversified portfolio, we then considered the weighting of each holding within its sector. To help us in the weighting process, we calculate an efficient frontier. This tool is used to weight the portfolio with the correct levels of risk and return. To calculate the efficient frontier, we use the macro in Excel, which changes the weights based on percentage constraints. The three points calculated are the highest return, the minimum standard deviation, also referred to as the minimum variance portfolio, and the lowest return. Our Any portfolio which lies on the frontier has the highest level of return for its given level of risk. Our portfolio does lie below the efficient frontier and to the right of the minimum variance portfolio. A major reason for this is that throughout our holding period, we held a select few stocks that had higher levels of unique risk, which we were not able to fully diversify away. At least once a week, we created a visual representation of our over and under performers in order to decide if we needed to reallocate our assets. The capital market line illustrates the relationship between a stock's daily standard deviation and average return. As you can see, based on this technique, we currently hold 19 overperforming assets. The security market line shows the relationship between market risk and return by graphing each asset of beta against its average daily return. We currently have 20 stocks that are outperforming and 5 that are underperforming on a market risk adjusted basis. These five are also underperformers on the capital market line. We justify holding the underperformers because we see strong growth going forward as they are undervalued and fundamentally sound companies. To now give you some insight into our current holdings, as earlier discussed by Tony and Al, we've decided on the weightings of each sector early on in the semester based on the economic cycle. This pie chart displays how we are overweighted in services, technology, and consumer goods, while underweighted in utilities, financials, and basic <coughs> From there, we decided on individual weightings of the stocks within the sector based on our company analysis. This pie chart shows that every industry is weighted close to 4%. However, we hold more industries within the sectors that we decided to overweight. When deciding on weightings, it was also important to take into consideration our objective of a large cap blend fund. Of the 74% value stocks we hold, the three largest dividend paying assets are Verizon, Northeast Utilities, and Intel. 5.5%, 3.9%, and 3.6% yield respectively. An example of a non-dividend paying asset we chose to hold for growth is MasterCard, which returned 14.7% over our holding period. After discussing the selection process, I am now proud to show you our final portfolio holding. Keep in mind that our, this portfolio differs from what we originally held due to active portfolio management and reallocation. This is also a great visual representation of what Suzanne earlier discussed, where we hold more companies in the sectors which we overweighted. Based on these holdings, here are some of our SIMS key statistics. Our weighted beta is 0.69, showing that we took on much less risk in the market over our holding period. Weighted trailing forward PE ratios are 19.37 and 16.97, respectively. Weighted PEG is 1.24, and the dividend yield is 2.3%. All of you are now probably wondering how we actually perform. Well, we compared ourselves to competitors with equivalent objectives on a raw return basis, and outperformed Vanguard, Fidelity, and J.P. Morgan Fund. As you can see, we did slightly underperform that of Prudential Genesis Blend A. However, we feel these are great benchmarks for comparison, as they are all highly rated, time-tested, well-known funds. And for our performance compared to the market, as of December 2nd, our portfolio returned 1.29% since its initial inception date on October 17th. During the same period, our benchmark, the S&P 500, returned 1.61%. But hang on. Raw return is not the industry standard when evaluating performance we're evaluating performance. When comparing to benchmarks and other funds, you have to take into account the amount of risk involved with the investment. Like industry, that is why we measure our true performance based on these three different calculations. Behind me are the ratios which we use to measure our performance on a risk-adjusted basis. The Sharpe Ratio is the first measure which student fund managers look at, which tells us how many units of reward we earn for every one unit of total risk we take on. As displayed above, we did slightly underperform the market in this regard due to a select few holdings containing high levels of unique risk. The trainer ratio is used commonly in industry as well. It simply shows the excess return earned for every one unit of market risk taken on. Using this calculation, we outperform the market on a systematic basis. Jensen's Alpha is the industry standard when comparing performance on a risk-adjusted basis. Ultimately, Alpha shows us if we outperformed or underperformed our benchmark, 
when considering the amount of risk taken on. Our output point, 176%, clearly shows that we have outperformed the market on a risk-adjusted basis. We'd now like to invite Tony and Alice to discuss the lessons that we have learned over this course of semester. Thank you, Ryan. As student fund managers, we gained a wealth of knowledge throughout this unique educational experience. We learned the importance of market timing, active portfolio management, and managing risks through portfolio reallocation. Tony will discuss market timing, the lessons learned, and how we will avoid these issues moving forward. Market timing is making a buy or sell decision on a specific financial asset by predicting future market movements. The SIP managers use this technique when deciding when to sell an equity and take profit. Silver Wheaton was one of our higher beta growth stocks. As you can see from our share price, it appreciated 16% from our initial purchase price. Hindsight being 2020, we should have sold out of our position and kept our profits. However, we did see future growth within the quarter, so we held on as it retreated back to our initial purchase price. Well, we do have stop losses on all of our positions. From the specific experience, we realized a trailing stop loss would benefit the group. Although we do have a buy and hold strategy, we realize we must maintain our fiduciary responsibility of protecting portfolio returns. In addition to active, or in addition to market timing, we learned the importance of active portfolio management. We learned specifically that current earnings releases are relatively very risky. We learned that if a company hits earnings, it does not necessarily mean its company will appreciate in share price. The chart behind me displays Julie provider Tiffany & Co. on November 29th. This is the date when they released an EPS increase of 63%. They did miss on future projections, lowering guidance, causing the stock price to lower 8.7%. $67.17. As you can see, these earnings releases are very risky. Not only do current earnings per share matter, but future guidance, revenues, cash flows, and even profit margins all play a large role in a company's earnings per share. On top of EPS releases, the team also learned about company-specific risk, which needed immediate action in the reallocation process. One company that we held in our portfolio that had negative behavioral data released was Haynes Brand. They closed down a factory, laid off workers and insiders began dumping large amounts of stock. With that being said, we sold out of our Haynes Brands position and acquired Nike. In blue is our Haynes Brands position, which we would have held on to, which would have saw a 12.6% decrease. However, since we swept into Nike, we saw a 5% share appreciation, which cut further losses and improved our portfolio efficiency. Now, to incorporate our lessons learned, Ryan, Danny, and Ashley will discuss our top picks moving forward. Thank you, Ralph. We would now like to present you what we believe to be strong stocks with solid growth going into the next 12 months. Starbucks Corporation is one of our exciting picks going into 2012. As you know, they're one of the world's most recognizable brands of high quality coffee and distinctive experience. Over the past two years, they've continued to aggressively saturate the global markets. They just raised their dividend after another solid quarter of earnings. Starbucks entered a deal with Green Mountain Coffee Roasters, allowing them to sell single serving K-Cups. Starbucks is making about two thirds of the profit from this deal, which is very substantial. Due to these solid fundamentals and behaviorals, we see strong growth out of Starbucks in the future. Another strong company that we believe will continue to see solid growth through 2012 is United Parcel Service Incorporated. UPS is the world's largest package delivery corporation offering various logistics and financial services. From a behavioral standpoint, UPS is continuing to expand. Earlier this year, they expanded their fleet in Asia by opening 10 additional ocean freight service ports and constructing several new distribution centers. More recently, UPS hired 55,000 employees to, as they believed their holiday season deliveries will be much higher than 2010. As we move forward to the first and second quarters of 2012, UPS has been selected to be the official logistics and express delivery supporter for the 2012 Summer Olympic and Paralympic Games hosted in London. As part of their contract, they will be required to deliver 30 million different items, including 1 million sports equipment items. Now on a fundamental level, UPS looks extremely solid as well. They are a high cash generator with high payout ratios as well. This year alone, their dividend yield growth rate is 4.4%. As we move into 2012, revenues are expected to increase 8% and earnings per share 19%. In addition to all this news, this year alone, the earnings per share growth rate is over 30%. All of this fundamental data, or, yeah, all this fundamental data shows us that while they are a large value corporation, they continue to show solid growth as we go forward. The next company that we feel will be rewarding moving forward comes from the consumer goods sector, selling products in high demand by women. Limited Brands currently owns seven world-renowned brands, primarily known for lingerie, personal care, home and beauty products. Their two major brands, Victoria's Secret and Bath and Body Works, account for 85% of sales. Limited Brands is one of the largest specialty retailers, operating 3,000 stores across North America. Over the past few years, they've been rapidly expanding into Canada due to increasing popularity. They've decided to avoid entering the European markets, with the exception of a few stores they will open in London next year. We see this lack of expansion as extremely responsible, given all of the current and future risks involved. They've instead decided to um, enter the wealthy cities in the Middle East. 
On a fundamental basis, limited brands is concrete. They surprised earnings quarter over quarter since before the recession began. Most recently, limited brands reported earnings per share 30 cents above expectation. Within the same time period, they were able to improve same store sales by 9%. Their net income has nearly quadrupled over the past two years, and on top of that, limited brands have zero short term debt. Offering products in intimate apparel and home and beauty care, limited brands' products are in high demand by women year round. On a behavioral standpoint, their products are must haves for on the holiday season. Limited brands is a specialty retailer with major upsides without all of the risk. This next investment is for those of you that believe the global economy will fare well in the future. Deere & Company is the world's largest producer of agriculture and forestry equipment by revenue. They offer a wide variety of high quality equipment for all of its users. Their domestic market share accounts with 58% of sales. Internationally, their market share should continue to increase mainly in Brazil, <coughs> excuse me, China, India, and Russia. In addition, their price is currently relatively inexpensive at only 11 times earnings per share, and in addition, Deere has consistently surprised earnings over the past 10 quarters while maintaining strong fundamentals on their books. Now that we have given you what we believe to be strong stock picks as we move forward, we'd like to give you our opinion on the market's future. While we are mildly bullish on the domestic economy, there's still much uncertainty, which is partially due to the lack of sustainable resolution to the Eurozone debt crisis. The U.S. is becoming more stable, but we need to reduce our deficit, which is currently 100% the size of our GDP. We believe that behavioral news will continue to drive volatility through 2012. It is unlikely that the Eurozone will come to a solid conclusion to avoid their massive debt problems. We suggest that investors put a heavy weight on fundamentally solid value securities that pay strong dividends. By doing so, investors will hedge their risk from any excess volatility in the market. Leland and Adam will now come up to conclude our presentation. Thank you, Ryan. As demonstrated throughout our presentation, students took on responsibilities similar to those required of fund managers in the industry today. Total commitment was necessary of the entire group in achieving our goal of constructing and managing a portfolio that beat our benchmark on a risk-adjusted basis. Now, Adam and I would like to touch on some valuable opportunities that were afforded to us over the course of the semester. First, we had the chance to travel to London to visit numerous financial institutions such as Lloyd's of London, the London Metals Exchange, J.O. Hambro Capital Investments, Bank of England, as well as the Baltic Exchange where we adopted our new slogan of Our Word, Our Bond, which we feel accurately depicts our attitude towards our fiduciary responsibility. At the Bank of England, we learned about the, the history of different currencies and economic policies from all over Europe. Thanks to Mr. Mario Gabelli, we had the opportunity to visit J.O. Hambro Capital Management, an independent investment firm with a global span. There, we sat down with Mr. Christopher Mills to discuss the Student Investment Management Fund, as well as gain valuable insight into the world of portfolio management on a larger scale. We also had the opportunity to host student fund managers from Northern Ohio University. These students chose to travel all the way to Roger Williams University to learn more about our in-depth, top-down approach to company selection. These students aspired to emulate our program. We spent an entire day sitting down with them, taking them through our entire process of portfolio management, by which they were impressed not only with the technology that we use, but also with how in-depth our analysis is. We would like to take this opportunity to thank each and every one of you for attending our semi-annual performance report. And now Leland and I will direct any questions that you guys may have. Any questions? Any questions? Um, in addition to just holding, do you guys invest in like options and commodities and uh, bonds? Um, no, we don't invest in bonds for the most part. Uh, we did have a ETF of tips, but we just we're an equity portfolio. That's what our objective is overall, so that's what we stick with and for the most part. We do spend some time aside trying to learn about different things just to better prepare ourselves even more, but we focus mainly on just equities. We also have had a little bit of exposure to commodities throughout the semester, but we generally do it through ETFs rather than through options or, or futures contracts. Um, because they're more liquid and easier for us to actually trade. Yep. Nope. Yep. Now, I'm here representing, you know, Rachel Maddow, John Stewart, and the left wing of the Democratic Party. Uh, Gary and I have talked about this in class a bit. When you select, I know your job is to make profits for your shareholders. Gary, um, Gary and I will explain that to you. But when you select your companies, do you ever think about the extent to which they're helping with job creation or engage in sustainable practices or don't? 
Um, we looked at it a little bit, but in managing a portfolio, our job is to make money, and that is our bottom line goal. We do like to take that into consideration. If we can find a company that helps out, you know, benefits to the world and jobs, that's better. But as a as a whole, we do try to make as much money as possible. We also have been uh, we have invested in some companies that have been hiring. Um, UPS primarily, Starbucks um, are some examples of these. McDonald's as well. Um, and from the socially responsible aspect, we we do not have a huge focus on it, but um, Darren also has some information that might provide you with a little more insight. Um, I believe it's Mattel, which um, is going green. They're doing everything they can with their toys. They're trying to manufacture more here than in China with due to all the catastrophes they've had in the past. Um, as well, all their, they're trying to make all their packaging more recycled, either with recycled material or make it so it's recycled. Great job, guys. Very impressive. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Sir? I have a question. You guys did a fantastic job. You all look great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, very impressive. You also uh, worked through one of the most volatile times in, in market history. So uh, congratulations for uh, the performance that you did. And we're all focusing this. You might want to just hard for some of the best managers you can do. Um, if you were to buy international shares, would you buy ADRs? Would you buy local shares? Do you have access to uh, not U.S. markets if you wanted to do that? For the most part, um, we would generally look more towards the ADR side, but uh, some companies that we have been trading uh, actually have, they're actually traded on our exchange. Like Nike, we actually hold Nike, which is a foreign company, but is traded on the New York Stock Exchange. So it's, it's more, we have a focus on liquidity because we have a very short time horizon, so we really need to remain liquid in the market at all times. If we had a, a global objective, we would be more towards the ADR. Sure. Um, the comment about the relative vol volatility, this is the third presentation I've been to in the last three semesters. It's been difficult for any professional, let alone a student. As you were going through this, then again, you commented about maybe a trailing stop loss or other things. What would you do differently? knowing what you know at the end of the semester, what did you do? For instance, I know as a professional, you get stopped out, and at the end of the day, the stock price is above your stop out price. What would you do, and what can you suggest to future student classes in terms of what you do, what type of strategies you might want to do, because the idea of a stop out <coughs> is, obviously, you lose, you're not going to lose as much. Protecting profits is a big thing, as you pointed out, in the, uh, the opportunity that you missed. Sure. Um, how would you do it, and what would you recommend from your experience? I think uh, I'm sure a couple of us will have some things to say. In addition to stop loss, uh, you know, stopping out and things like that, we would also take profits earlier too. We we saw generous profits, and we maybe got a little greedy, felt they would still go higher. So with the market this volatile, you can take smaller profits and just do that as often as possible. So you can guarantee that you have those gains. And I think to to combat the actual volatility of the market. Um, technical analysis is, is going to play a, a larger role than what we initially expected. We can use all these technical indicators to, to show directional momentum and stuff like that. Um, so we would definitely focus a little bit more on technical analysis. Um, although with the volatility, we have seen a few whipsaw effects throughout the semester. So it would have to be a conjunction of a few different a few different methods. And as far as stop losses, a good way to use it is the standard deviation going either one or two standard deviations away. So it widens your stop loss percentage loss. Um, in this way, when you have a profit though, you would, you would tighten your stop so you guarantee a profit. However, as, as you were saying, the volatility in the markets, the widening them uh, would stop, would prevent you from stopping out right away instead of um, and touching the stop and then bouncing right back like you were saying as your price would go right back. Did you, were there any days that you got stopped out that you would go right back in after you were stopped out at the same time? Of course. Um, yeah, we did have instances of that. Also, another thing I would add is, it's okay now to have some of your money in cash is not for longer than you normally would, and wait for better timing. Not necessarily when the market's better, but during the week, you don't need to have all your money in the assets at all times. If you're managing your portfolio the way we do, you need to really focus on timing, and that's where technical analysis can really come in as well. For our, for our group? Yeah. We like to have um, like 10% in cash we can use for different momentum plays and things like that. 
So that's where we can use the behavioral and technical analysis to make a trade. That's normally one of the our portfolio, but to try to increase our gains. Mm -hmm. Besides that, we do keep the rest of our money in our holdings, and we always have sweeps ready in case something comes up, whether behaviorally, performance-wise, we can take out that stock and have one right in place. Sir? Did you uh, listen to the earnings conference calls on most of the stocks and make any trades there? For the most part, for the most part, we tried to listen to them whenever they were available to us. Um, it's easier for us to get scripts of what happened, so we do lag a little bit. But generally, most of the companies, uh, we were lucky. Most of our companies reported after the bell, uh, after four o'clock. So the the transcripts that we could read would give us insight into how to play the stock the next morning. But otherwise, if there was a stock that op that had an earnings release in the morning, sometimes we would lag behind. The, the rest of the market sentiment on that particular stock on certain occasions. But yeah, earnings calls definitely do give you very good insight, especially when you hear the CFOs or CEOs speak about guidance because that's that's huge in predicting where the company's revenues and profits are going to be in the future. So. In, in that regard, did you listen to companies you work for instance, you suggested uh, uh, Deer, did you listen to CAC? Absolutely. We, we focus on particular sectors uh, as student fund managers, we each our own thing, and we focused on all the main direct competitors, the industry leaders, because we realized how our company could be affected by things like that, and we absolutely paid attention to any main competitor in the, in the industry. For example, uh, while we held MasterCard, Visa released their earnings, and their earnings were very good, so it gave us good news on MasterCard as well. Can you provide some additional color in terms of how you, you, you move to the 250 stock to start with, given the Russell 3000, for example, and then what you did to move to the 25? Was it solely based on the correlation? It was the based on to 250 to 25? The, the entire process, starting with the fundamentals. We performed all these, the ratios, the comparison using our stoplight technique, the coloring. We <coughs> performed all those analyses, and then that's how we brought it down to 25. And additionally, we looked into like the top within each sector, there's industries that were outperforming, and we tried to look into those industries to find the top performing stocks, and from there, that definitely um, narrowed down our stock base. And during our company selection process, we always had to keep in mind our objective of the large cap domestic one. And of the metrics that you track, which do you think is the best gauge in terms of quality of management? Um, I would say, I would say ratios such as return on assets, return on investment, return on uh, on equity, things like that, because that is actually a direct reflection of how management is, is handling the operation of the company. Terrific job. And Thank you. Uh, you look like you're a well-tuned machine, a wonderful team. How did you get there? Can you speak a little bit to the beginning of the development of your team process? What were some of the challenges that you encountered and how did you address those? All right, um, if you guys would all turn around for a second, I know he doesn't like <laughs> taking credit, but Dr. Mountain back there is, uh, he's, he has bred us from start to finish. Um, so academically, we all have very similar backgrounds and um, while we do have little niches within our studies, we, we do have generally the same philosophies. So we work very well as a team from the start, we always have. And uh, I think with it, within this group, we have a very, very strong dynamic, and we work very well together. Essentially, I'm sorry, Mom and Dad, but we are a family as well. <laughs> so, <laughs> so yeah, it's, it really comes with the, the dynamics of the group. We just, we really enjoy each other's company. We work well together. We, everyone knows each other's strengths and weaknesses. So we just excel from, from those perspectives. we held Apple and from a fundamental and behavioral perspective Apple is rock solid uh, pretty much everybody knows this and uh, however we decided to double our holdings right before their earnings call because for the past uh, it was over 10 quarters in a row they have surprised and beat actual street uh, expectations of 10% or over on each one of those 10 quarters so we kind of went with I, I, it was my idea I'm not gonna lie <laughs> But um, when I pitched it, we actually had a five and five split, but I had actually decided to take a few people aside and 
kind of kind of sway their yeah, sway their decision a little bit. We ended up placing the trade, and it actually didn't work out in our favor. They, while increasing their profits over 60 percent, they did meet, miss street expectations. So the, the share price uh, decreased, and we actually did take a little bit of a hit on that. Now I'll turn it around. What was the one? That, what was the investment that surprised you? The Outperforming, you went in with expectation. Because again, you started saying you start. You mentioned taking small profits and not getting greedy. You know, again, just like to, uh, realizing losses. When do you make that decision? What is and if you have expectations going in? What was the one that out that was better than you expected? And then how would you put on new measures next time? Say, well, if it's, if it's up, if my expectation is up five and it's up six. I take my profit, or if it's up four, I take my profit. How would you do that? Okay, um, one that surprised us with uh, the gains, we talked about EUFN, the ETF that we bought, the European Financials, and we gained 11% on that in less than 24 hours, I believe it was. And we were confident about this as a whole. This had a full group consensus. The only question was whether we wanted EUFN, the ETF, or Deutsche Bank. And then we figured, let's not put all our eggs in one company, we'll take the ETF, Deutsche Bank did indeed in turn return 19% in that same 24 hour period. So we didn't look back on it. We played Monday morning quarterback. We were fine with our 11%. We did sell out the next day right away, uh, which was perfect timing. So that was definitely one that we were pleased, surprised with how well it turned out. And I'm sorry, what was the second part? Uh, the second one was you, you mentioned that in the future you would take, you wouldn't be so greedy. So would you instead put limits and say, I expect this to be a 10% return? We're in a world that a 5% move can happen in a day, so I see it's a little hard. But is there one that you would say, if I hit this number, I should sell or take cover it off or something like that? We talked about 10 as a number that we should really seriously sit down and start to take profits. We did see uh, our holdings that went over 10%, and did you they take weren't. Marshalls? No, we didn't. We either took, except for when we took less out of Apple, we just either sold or bought. We didn't take partials because of the amount of money we're given to put in. That transaction costs play a big role if we took out a partial percentage of our holdings. So. To build upon that answer, I think the first the first question you had, as far as one of our holdings, I think BlackRock, which is actually a financial, returned us around 13%, which was surprising, as the financial sector didn't, actually, didn't perform too well during our holding period. So, yeah, that was another great return to be found. Yeah, just to touch upon uh, the taking gains, um, as we saw gains, like if 5%, we would, well, halfway through the semester, we decided to tighten the stop loss, and then as it got to 10, tighten it even more. That way, we knew we were solidifying some of the gains that we said uh, we could count on. Also, to touch on, uh, you, you mentioned setting a goal for when we would start to take profit. I think that should be a function of beta as that shows the, the amount of fluctuation we should see within each each security. So I think that by, by analyzing each company's beta, we can set an accurate target of where we where we think the stock should be based on the volatility inherent in the stock. All right, well, again, we'd like to thank everybody for attending today. We hope you have advisory board meeting and uh, I, one of the things I mentioned to the advisory board is you know, sometimes it's kind of fun to be dean of business school. This is one of those times. Every every semester at this time it is one of those times when it really is fun to be dean of the Valley School because I can stand up here and pretend I have something to do with this. And uh, I really did other than the fact that I did teach legally his first economics course as a freshman four years ago. Other than that, uh, the people that are responsible for, for this kind of, uh, you know, presentation or, or in this room, a lot of them are our finance faculty, Professor Goss, uh, uh, Professor Smuts, uh, John McCook in accounting, to the Files <coughs> Finance, uh, my assistant deans, Dean Strong, Dean Rhoda, uh, my assistant, Vincent Berlinos, the person that uh, I think has something to do with this as well, uh, Mike Sylvia, our facility staff. <laughs> Mike, you're out of the leaving when I come to school. You're, yeah, you're 11, 11 to 7? 11 to 7. So Mike's always leaving when I get to the office. And this morning as I came in, 
Mike said, you know, I'm coming to the presentation today. I said, you already finished He said, yeah, i got to support my guys. <laughs> and that just gives you an indication of the kind of work ethic that these yeah. people have. And that, you know, I certainly can't take credit for. But again, a lot of the people in this room who happen to be parents of these uh, wonderful students, you know, can take credit for that. And so I want to thank the families for providing us with this kind of raw material because it makes our job uh, a lot easier. Uh, I guess I... Oh, Michael Melvin. <laughs> uh, Michael is a, is a finance faculty member uh, who heads up this program, is the director of the center. Uh, but I, I'm sitting here watching him, and it's driving me crazy. His, his, his roots are in coaching. His, his dad was defense coordinator for the University of Nebraska forever. And, and so Mike, Michael acts like a coach. I mean, and he, sit, he stands there the whole time, pacing back and forth. All he needs to do is on the sidelines. So, so basically, his real love you know, would be on the sidelines with his dad, uh, coaching the University of Nebraska. He couldn't get that job, so <laughs> we're really grateful for that. But I, I did want to you know, just mention one other thing that I, I think is really special. Uh, we just went through an AECSB maintenance of accreditation visit last year. Uh, AECSB is the you know, uh, gold standard in terms of business accreditation. Less than 5% of all business schools worldwide are accredited by the AACSB. We had a very good visit last year. And the visitation team involves three deans who do a lot of these visits, and that went very well. And so this semester, early in the semester, I got a call from one of the deans that uh, was part of our visitation team, Jim Fenton from Ohio Northern University. And again, he's been needed at a couple of schools, he's visited schools, and he called me and said, you know, Jerry, you know, we're starting up a portfolio management program for our students. And I want to send, you know, our faculty member and some of our students to Roger Williams to see what you do. I want them to meet with these students. And and so so Jim from Ohio Northern University sent his faculty member, his students, to our school to learn what I think is you know, the best of the best. So I'm very proud of that. And the students did a great job, and Michael did a great job uh, with them. So I, I just you know, uh, think I'm very proud of that. Also, the maintenance of accreditation because it went very well, as I told the president, so we're very proud of that. Uh, again, I want to thank you all for you know, your participation today. I want to thank these wonderful students. They have, you know, it's a, one of the great things about this is I'm now at that stage where, you know, I, I said initially, when I met with the seniors, I, I do some exit interviews, and I meet with our seniors, and any time I meet with a senior to do an exit interview, they've been to this program and say, oh, the best experience for Roger Williams was this experience in you know, Finance 450, the portfolio management. Well, now I'm at that stage where I'm actually you know, getting to know some of the alums, and one of the great things about going out and meeting alums, as we have in Boston and New York, is to see the products of this program. Some of whom are here today. Uh, all of you who've been to this program, would you raise your hands? Yeah, and, and what's great about it is, you know, if they're in the industry, they talk about how much this program prepared them for the industry. But even if they're not in the industry, I was struck, we did a visit recently uh, up to Boston, uh, where we met with some alums, and one of the alums uh, was from before my time, but he had been one of the early students in this program. And he had been in the finance industry for a while, in the investment industry for a while, you know, after he graduated. You know, just what his thing, and he's changed. Now he's doing something totally different. He's basically involved in placement you know, of IT professionals. But even he talked about how much this program contributed to his preparation. You know, Dean, our success. head wrestling coach. Hmm? Our head wrestling coach. <laughs> our, our new head wrestling coach is another product of this <laughs> So this program will prepare these students for success. And that's why I told my advisory board that, again, it's all about experiential learning, you know, getting the students, you know, getting them real, make it real, and that's what this program does. So I'm very proud of that. Again, we have a nice reception set up outside. I hope you'll join us. I hope you'll grab these students, you know, pick their brains, find out, you know, about other stock uh, ideas, find out what their plans are for the future. But again, and I hope to see you here in the spring as we do this once again. Thank you very much.